Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Hey, Tony, there's something that every solo entrepreneur needs to hear. If you're running your own show, you know how important branding and client management are. And speaking of making things easier for solopreneurs, let's talk about Schedulicity. It's designed to personalize your client interactions from start to finish. Schedulicity has some cool new features coming. You'll soon be able to customize your booking page, add your own logos, choose your colors, and really make it sing to your brand's personality. It's like giving your business a digital front door that looks and feels like you. Schedulicity isn't just about looking good. Schedulicity is designed to make everything smoother from booking to billing. You know, it's not just about the looks, it's about efficiency too. They've integrated something pretty slick, intake forms. Now clients can fill out all the details before they even step foot into the door. What's cool is these forms attach to the client's profile and update automatically for future appointments. Talk about saving time and starting on schedule. It's your schedule and your success all rolled into one. With all these tools from Schedulicity, you're not just running your business, you're growing it. And for all the solopreneurs and sweet owners out there, this is exactly the kind of support we need to stand out in a crowded market. Corey and dude, my throat is done. Do you hear that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome to your day off. My name is Corey. And I'm sitting with my best friend Tom. What's up, buddy? What's going on? Man, I'm, I'm excited about this weekend. We're live in Chicago at ABS, but first and foremost, we got to give a big shout out to Schedulicity. Schedulicity is sponsoring this weekend for us. They've kind of brought us up here and allowed us to chat. And you know, um, we we talk about it every time we get the opportunity. But uh, you know, Schedulicity is our dogs. Yeah, you know, it's funny when we started this podcast, and you know, we kind of had a vision of what we wanted, but and, and kind of the people we want to be around. But really couldn't really kind of put it in a funnel and, and streamline that until we met Schedulicity. When we first met them and, and the way they put uh, the hairdressers first, the way they put us first, and just like they wanted to support this industry, we're like, these are the people that we want to surround ourselves with. And, you know, and fortunately enough, we've been able to uh, have them in our lives this whole time. Yeah, b- big fan of Schedulicity, big fan of what they're doing. Um, uh, sadly or not sadly, like I I, uh, I compare every customer service experience with the with the rock stars at, at Schedulicity. Because That's unfair for the rest tot- of the company. It totally <laughs> is, right? Like, you know, though, I, I kind of feel this way is that. If if you're a company and you're you're dealing with the public and your customer service service department isn't where you're investing your most money or at least where your most focus is, then are you really into the customer service business? You know, I, I'm with you a thousand percent. You call you call Comcast. You're like, this is annoying. It does not have to be this much friction. You know, and I think if that's it, like schedulicity, whenever you have an issue or you need you need customer support. Like there's no friction; it just gets done. Yeah, yeah which is so, yeah. which is seems to me like basic, like business 101. It doesn't even make sense that there's any friction with customer service at all. But they do it with a passion, and, and you feel that energy like they truly care. Because they, they, they do. Yeah, because yeah, they do. You know, which which is amazing. Otherwise, I feel like I'm annoying most companies. You know, like or, uh, you're annoying them, really, right? Yeah. You call them and like, oh, you're calling me, you're like. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we, do? are we giving money? you money? Right. <laughs> like, like, don't, we have an, don't we have an agreement here? Right. I pay you and you make my life easier? Like, yeah. isn't that supposed to be the world? So, anyways, that's crazy. I can go on and on and on and on about that. Um, we also want to thank ABS. We want to thank our friend Kate Gallagher. And we want to thank Frank Folco for always bringing us up and, and, and treating us like uh, like VIPs, These even though we're dorks. Yeah, and seeing Frank last night and meeting his wife and just, just great people, in the, you know what I mean, who want to do great things in our industry for the people in the industry, too. Like, dude, when we walked the floor yesterday, compared to, like, when, when we walked it a couple years ago, man, uh, they've done an incredible job. <sighs> like, like the education that, you, that you're getting, the brands that are here, the people that showed up for that education, the brands that are here, is amazing. So, bravo to Frank and Kate and, and the entire ABS team. Yeah, and they make it so easy. And it's just, if you haven't been here, I come here and you'll see why. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. It happens once a year and, and you should be experiencing it. Um you know, we love these big hair shows and get to uh, get to hang out here. 
what we love most about it is that we get to do live podcast and um and that's what we're doing today so uh this whole weekend we've been doing live podcast and i'm excited about today it's a it's a it's a it's a person that we met through our dear friend mr jay ladner we uh we met her in new york in in a green room somewhere but uh once we <laughs> met her she's so dynamic so beautiful so everything that we were like we got to talk to her but we also have to talk to her live that kind of sounded way creeper than i intended to sound right. <laughs> however, <laughs> however um it was it fit the way you look brother <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I, I get that too. <laughs> Coffee shirt and all. <laughs> um, so today we're talking to Martina Nichols, and we're we're going to get into Martina's uh, career and let her uh, let her chat about her her own self. We'll embarrass her some, and I'm sure we'll have a couple laughs. But Miss Martina Nichols, welcome to your day off. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I can probably embarrass myself on my own, too, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll we, see we're how hoping goes. for that. Yes. Yes. We'll, we'll kind of guide you into that. You know, we're just hanging out, so you never know what I'm going to say, right? That's right. It'll be great. So yeah. let's start it off. Where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm actually from here. I'm originally from Chicago, South Side, but I live in Phoenix. Moved to Phoenix, grew up in Phoenix, been there about 25 years. What took you there? Family. My mom hated the cold. Also, oh. grew up on the South Side of Chicago in the early 90s. Wasn't a great time to be there, and so just moved away for more opportunity. But you got Michael Jordan. We did have Michael Jordan. Yeah. Still better than LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Chicago old timers agree with you. Yes, <laughs> right. We agree. Yeah, yes. there's no debate to me. No, you know? I'm excited for the sky too. Like seeing the WNBA and what's going on. Too, I'm such a sports fan, so I'm uh -huh. like, okay, Chicago, what are we gonna do? Because I'm not a Phoenix sports fan. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't hate them. Right. I just grew up with all my Chicago teams. So yeah, I mean, once you're thick in there, right? Yeah. So you like you like Caleb Williams is. Uh, Maybe coming to the Bears. I mean, we were recording this a little bit, I'm, a week before I'm the draft. I'm hoping, but also the Bears are like my biggest heartbreak of my life. I'll be 35 right. in July. They have not won my whole life, so. That's right. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm an Atlanta fan, so oh, I, I feel yeah. you. We, we can share pain. We can, <laughs> we can share pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, man. It is crazy. But yeah, it's, it's uh, Chicago, like, when you're, when you're a Chicago, it's like a New York fan. Like, when you're a fan of Chicago, like, like you move yeah. to Phoenix and you're like, that doesn't mean anything. Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, it's like die hard. Doesn't matter how much they lose, if they win. I feel like they've had kind of good dynasties, like the Bulls and even like the Blackhawks are really good too. Mm -hmm. So, you a hockey fan? Yeah, yeah, I kind of like hockey. It's nice to get in somewhere cold in Phoenix too. To oh, be like, fair. okay, let's go oh, to watch hockey yeah. because it's cold in there and it'll right? be great. Yeah, so all over really. Yeah, we got the Caps. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. got the, the, the pain of the Wizards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the yes. the yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. and then Phoenix has been great, too. Phoenix is just a really chill time to hang out there. I love doing hair in Phoenix. I like the pace of it for what I do, too. I'm working with texture. There's not a lot of people in my area that do what I do, so it's right. really nice to be able to differentiate just from the fact of kind of being the only few I've people never, there. I've never been to Arizona, and I've always, because we have clients that go all the time and they speak highly of Arizona yeah. and how beautiful it is, and it's, it's on my bucket list, but just, you know, I haven't had a really a true opportunity to make it happen. Yeah, you've got to come out. Yeah. You've got to yeah. come out. I've been encountering so many more people that when I tell them I'm from there, most of the people I meet now have been there, which is crazy, because that's probably only happened in the last, like, five years. Is it booming, is it like, 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 how people are moving to Montana, Utah. Yeah. And, it, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's booming. It's a lot of people coming from California. And so everywhere that I've been there for 25 years, everywhere I used to drive past that used to be like a field or farmland, I'm like, wow, they have a high rise here now <laughs> or a parking lot. Like we're not going to have any more free space, which is cool. And it's also kind of nostalgic because I feel like it was yeah. nice when it was quiet. But there's so many good things coming there. A lot more culture, a lot more great food. Yeah, but Phoenix has its own culture too, right? Yeah. You know, indigenous culture yeah. and like a lot of history in that sense too, right? Yeah, a lot of that. A lot of kind of Mexican American transplant culture too, which is really nice. So you get a little bit of everything. Great food. Always I, great food. Whenever I think of Phoenix, I think of turquoise. I don't know why. It just yeah. seems like it's everywhere. Yeah, and honestly, the Suns did like a launch or they did the Valley series and they like really honored the indigenous people mm -hmm. in the population that was really cool too and a lot of turquoise a lot, a lot, a lot of, of turquoise, turquoise. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i like mexican food tex-mex i like all that, that yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah we don't have a our food is a little different than tex-mex i feel like it's a little it they're just different i was gonna say it's better but i'm like you know it's just a different flavor just yeah. Yeah. but Sounds it's nice great. it's great I mean, literally a different flavor. Yeah, yeah, literally <laughs> <laughs> from Mexico, Arizona instead of Texas, Mexico. I guess, yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah. It's great. Yeah, that's that's crazy. How'd you mm -hmm. find? How'd you get in the hair industry? 
um, by accident, you know, 50-50, right? Some people want to do it, and some people were like, I'm just going to go to beauty school, and I was that person. I was kind of styling. I played basketball, so I was styling, like, the girl's hair, braiding it, doing things like that, styling people's hair for prom, but never had a hairstylist growing up, really, and never really thought about it being a career or my career. Mm -hmm. And I had someone recommend it to me and was just like, you should go to hair school. And I went and signed up that day, and that was 16 years ago. Wow. I'm doing it ever since. Yeah. Like what, what, what did you see for your future if it wasn't hair? I don't know, which is the crazier part, because I originally, growing up, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And then at some point, I just stopped being able to deal with blood. Like right now, if somebody really? had a really bad paper cut, I'd be like, I can't look. I might, I might pass out. Like if you're dripping blood, it flipped like overnight. So then for me, I'm like, okay, universe, I'm not supposed to be doing this. What am I supposed to be doing? And I just stuck with hair because I really enjoyed it. I knew I didn't want to sit at a desk. I knew I wanted flexibility. I knew that I didn't necessarily want a corporate boss, corporate type of structure, but I had mm -hmm. no idea what that looked like. And so I'm just really grateful to still be loving it and in it and like, Listen, here. I agree with everything you said except the one word, and that's flexibility. I've never found flexibility in our industry. Like, like, like I think it's something that's sold to us, but I've never really found that. Like, I don't, I mean, I guess compared to, I don't know, though. I, I've never really kind of felt that. I, I get that. And I, I don't think that, I think from the sense of flexibility where you're sitting in beauty school and it's like, you're going to make your own schedule and you can work with it. We don't really have that, but the transition from me working on a hair type that was traditionally taught in beauty school to then doing curls to then now doing independent education or like being able to work with brands that shift in that mobility, I guess mm -hmm. is a better term. Because yeah. I agree with you on the flexibility. No, I There's disagree. Not, oh, do you? Yeah, be because as you get older and, and you know, you're here, like, um, because your schedule is so flexible. You yep. can take off any day you want. You can mm -hmm. work any day you want. You can work how many days you want. Right, but also, but also, that's a very recent thing, and that's also a thing as working in But a that's a recent thing that you decided to do. You could have done it a while ago, but you decided just to do it, right? So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of risk involved in the yeah. flexibility that you might choose. But well, yeah, that, and that's, you know, like, like we, we, were, we all were told on the first day of hair school that, like, you can go anywhere in the country and do hair. Right. I'm like, not what you have a clientele, you can't. <laughs> no. You know, no. because now you have a lifestyle that you've got to live up to, you know, mm -hmm. now, now you've got that. So, you know, it's like you, you try to go and, like, and there's nothing that's more intimidating to me in the world than having to rebook, rebuild a book. Right. You know, like, like that, that'll keep me put. Yep, literally. <laughs> you have the literally. flexibility to do it. I mean, you have the opportunity to do it. A lot of careers don't have that. Yeah, as long I, as there's I, heads, I think there's you a have an opportunity. I think there's a different word than flexibility, though. But now, know? talk about for your schedule, there's a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I mean, now, yeah. right? Now, since I left, you know, uh, corporate salons. But like mm -hmm. Emmett, when you're with Emily Emmett, she, she decided to do it from day one. And, well, and bravo to her. Right. And, you know, and, she, but and, she's, and she's doing it. Yeah. Sure. Right. However, I also think that for the majority, that's a... Uh, that could be but, a suicide. But I'm just being like the devil's advocate because, you know, most people have to work nine to five, yeah. Monday through Friday. Yeah. You know, she can decide, you know what, I want to work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and take the rest of the week off. Or, yeah. I, you know, I want to work evenings and work days. I mean, there's a plenty of. You know what I find anyway. interesting kind of about that is that we um, and I don't know. And, I, I, you know, we've been doing hair for 30 years. Right. So yeah. I don't know if it's my clientele or if the world's changed. Mm -hmm. But like when I was a young hairdresser, like you couldn't get an appointment for Saturday for six months. Right. Right now, like, because I don't know if it's because the world's um, schedules are more flexible mm -hmm. or that, like, the age of our clients now have more flexibility in their job and stuff. But I'm curious if if, if you're just starting out, is there still the pull on Saturdays or is has the world just changed? I think it's both, depending on where you are. Because for me, I would advise someone to work Saturdays to build a book faster because more people are available. But then on the flip side with flexibility, if you're thinking long term, what do you want to do? It's like, well, if you never want to work Saturdays, why build a clientele of people that are available on Saturdays? But mm -hmm. you probably are going to have to have a part time job or really hustle or do something, yeah, or something while you're building outside of that. But I think it is the shift. I have a lot of guests that have most people are like, I have PTO that I never use. I'm not leaving it. And I'm like, book your appointment. Book Take your that appointment. day off. Exactly. Like. If something happened to you, they would replace you in three days. Like, make sure you take all your time and do it for your haircut appointment. There's so a I lot more be here on Saturday. A lot more telecommuting now, too, yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many times are you? I, I know we we do clients, and they're literally in meetings yep. as yep. we're talking Same about. Same thing. And okay. I don't care. No, I don't I'm either. Like, 
I'm like, you're not here on Saturday? Cool. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Same thing. Or it's like, and you're not coming in at 5 or 5.30? Yeah. Great. Whatever yeah. meeting you have. Do I need to be quiet? Like, let yeah. me know. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. you can do what you got to do. Yeah, you so can shake dry. Right. We're, <laughs> exactly. We're good. So w- w- was your mom and dad or your mom, were they happy with, with the decision of going to hair school? No. No. Um, so my mom was the first person in my family that went to college. And she went to college. She ended up getting like a PhD. And so the whole time oh. that I would be doing hair, going to school, all that. She was always, she never came to see me. She was not one of my clients in cosmetology school. Not one time. (laughs) Because she was like, well, you don't do hair. Like, you're in school. I'm like, yeah, well, you don't want to help me get to doing hair? Never came in. But she was definitely a client in the salon. And she always But you know what? That's like saying you're not smart because you're getting your PhD. Right. You're not smart until you get your PhD. Well, and see, I would flip that on her and be like, well, you had this degree that you never use. Like, at least I have something that I'm not going to pay an exorbitant amount of money on for the rest of my life that I can go work right away. I have experience, and it's fun. I love it. Mm-hmm. And so she passed away in 2016. But, I mean, up until then, she was always on, when are you going to go back to college? I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> not. I don't think so. I mean, I could, but I've learned so much and picked up so much. I'd rather take a customized business course or something that I know I can take from it right away than go and take a math class and an English class and like right. no absolutely not so I'm glad I'm glad it t- took me a while to get to the point to where I was really solid in it though and being like no this is where I'm at what I want to do I appreciate it for these reasons it's been great in my life and there's nothing bad about not going a traditional college route and a lot of panels and stuff I talk on, too. I go to one of the local colleges that's by me, one of our universities, Grand Canyon, and I always get questions that are like, we really admire that you didn't take the traditional route. How, what type of advice would you have, or how did you get to that? There's so many people that want to break out of that, but society tells them not to. That, that's crazy, because, we, I mean, going back to, you, t- you said math and English, yeah. and all, or, you know, I think we should take a... a how we did the military, like you take the ASVAB to see where your strengths are. So, you know, they kind of like, you know, here, these, these these are where you probably excel most or whatever. Right. But when we get out of school, you know, you got to continue your education. You're spending a hundred grand on classes that you'll never, ever use right. in your life. You know, right. they're forcing you to do it because it has to be a, a prereq to, in order to, to get where you really want to go, right. which is to me, it's, it's, it's kind of... I, 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 I agree. I mean, it, w- it was crazy. Like when my daughter started college and like the first year was all the same high school classes that she had. And, y- right. and you're like, what are we paying for here? Exactly. You know, I a mean, recap. luckily she did it at community college. So, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't like bankrupting, but, but it was still just, just, just to go through that process. And like, why is everybody in remedials? Right. Right. You know? And that was my route too. I went to community college and after my first semester, because they do like a placement test, I didn't pick a major because I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and I didn't want them to start and to textured funnel hair me. wasn't on yeah. the, it, it wasn't, wasn't an option. O- it wasn't an option, right? That mm-hmm. wasn't an option in beauty school either. But I yeah. one didn't want them to funnel me. But I tested out of like math and science, so I couldn't take any more classes until I picked a major, and that's actually when I ended up in beauty school. Wow! I was like, well, I'm going to take a year off and you see know, what I want to do, what's going to happen, and here we are. You know, I think I think it's important to say too that whatever path you pick, whether it's this path or whether it's the traditional college yeah. path is that all that's important is that you continue that education. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think, I think it, you're not doing yourself, you're doing yourself a disservice if you, if you get out of hair school and then that's it. Yeah. Right. Or, or if you, if you're not like really like focused on something, right. You know? Um, and, and I like the, I, at least the way that I learn is I have to be a hundred percent, whether it's, if it's textured hair, I bet I need to be 100% focused on that. Yeah. But then, like, maybe two or three years from now, I go, okay, I kind of lose interest in that, or I want to learn something new, mm-hmm. and then I'll be completely focused on balayage or whatever it is. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but but I think I think that's the path for a lot of us um, in hairdressing. Um, but I think it's really, really important that we, uh, we, we continue. I mean, hence this weekend. Yes, right. Hence absolutely. these live shows, you know, like this, this is where you come and get the education. Yeah. And well, if you want the, the mobility, if you want to be able to move up in your career, if you want to be able to do the things that you want to choose to do, you have to have education because it gives you so much more opportunity. Now, you know, so many other skills or, you know, how to speak on stage or, you know, how to do an interview. Like it just really expands all of your opportunities. But when, and you, when you started hair school, did, did, it, did something just feel right? Did yeah, you, you just kind of knew that this is this is it. This is I'm in I, my place. I did, and I had no idea. Like 
I had no clue about hair. So I remember in like our freshman hours, it was like, okay, we're going to do a blowout on this mannequin. And I was like, okay, <laughs> are you going to show us? Because <laughs> I've never done this before. But I also came from a different experience. Like my hair texture, I wouldn't use a round brush on and blow out. So it was a different type of learning curve. Like perm rods, my mom used to set her hair with those as rollers. So we started doing perms. And in my mind, a perm is a relaxer. So it was such a different dynamic and in getting into it. And then once I really started to learn it, I loved it. I was doing the owner's wife's hair and all of his friend's hair. I was like the it person, my little bit right. of time, which was really cool. But I also feel like it was my ADHD and OCD of like the foils had to be perfect and everything had to be placed like uh -huh. everywhere. So it looked great. Right. right. Yeah. So. That is interesting how as an industry, and I, I, would, I would love to know like where, what the genesis of it is, is that, yeah. is, is how a perm in two different, on two different people is, is, com it's is completely the exact, different. no, literally the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it is literally, okay, so this is what I think it is. I think it's because a relaxer is a permanent service, like a permanent wave, and I feel like it just got cut short to the perm. I mean, I'm, that probably I'm, makes sense. I mean, right. I'm that not total sure, sense. Yeah. but right. if, I think that's Both why. of them are permanent. <laughs> right. <laughs> permanent <laughs> chemical <laughs> services. So it just got shortened yeah. to a perm. Yeah. Yeah. But different chemicals, too, though, right? Completely. Completely yeah, different, different yeah. chemicals, different process, different results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I was like, wait a minute, we're going to do what on this? Like... This hair is straight. Why do you want <laughs> to put a chemical on it to straighten it? That doesn't make sense at all. And then uh, they pulled out the rods, and I'm like, no, see, those are rollers. Like, I'm so confused about what is going on right now. <laughs> and now I love perms. Right. Uh, I love to do perms. Curly perms? Yeah. I'm actually bringing in doing corrective curly perms. Well, we'll talk about this. So most of my curly guests that I see, the two most complaints that I hear from people, their textures aren't the same and they don't get enough volume, right? So why don't I perm your bottom texture that's looser so it's more tight like the top? Or why don't we do a horseshoe and make those curls half a size smaller or size smaller so that you'll get that volume naturally without having to do so much styling, using so much product, having to refresh so much. So I'm- really you, I, I, And I, I, I kind of feel like I should know this, but like if you do like a horseshoe section in the front, how do you not like chemically straighten the hair under it? Well, that's what I'm getting into now. So <laughs> I have been just kind of clipping it out of the way, put making sure they're like in the bowl when I'm applying their perm so that it's not really dripping on everything. But the perm I used to is pretty mild. So it's been all right. I've had that same kind of question on myself too. But it's act I've actually been able to figure it out pretty well. We need to uh, maybe like let them do a handstand and just right. like everything can drip you, Can you just sit in the chair, flip forward, and then we'll We're going to call this way. a non-skirt service. <laughs> right. That might actually, I'm like thinking about it. Okay, turn my chair around, put a towel on the floor. They can lean forward because they're used to that diffusing anyway. Uh -huh. You might have just helped me solve an issue. Well, Tony yeah. has a client that uh, that he has to shampoo like upside down because she has a neck injury. Oh, yeah. So like that, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, so yeah. She yeah. puts her knees on the chair and lean her whole head into the bowl. In the bowl, yeah. 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 It's crazy the things that we can do and, yeah. like, how we can accommodate. You know what I mean? It's like amazing the things that people allow us to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and half the time it's their idea. They're yeah. like, you know, I, w I don't mind. You can just, I can go ahead first in the bowl. Like, sure, let's try it. <laughs> just remember, it came from you. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. That's so what crazy. So what was your uh, career path, like, after hair school? After hair school, I worked, um, I actually went to Ulta. I worked at Ulta for about a year and a half and then went to a studio, which, looking back, I would have loved to stay maybe in somewhere corporate a little bit longer. I never really assisted, had a mentor or anything until probably the last like three, four years. Jay's been a really great mentor to me. Sure. And so I went into studio life for about six years. And then after that, I really got into curls, transitioned my hair and started wearing my hair natural a lot more often and really just cut out heat in general. And then my clients started to ask what I was doing, what was going on. And so... That really shifted me, and I got to a point in my career to where it was like, okay, if I'm going to get into this, I'm going to get into this. But I was also in a suburb of Phoenix, and I knew if I was looking for someone, I wasn't going to look up hairstylists in Peoria, Arizona. Like, what's that? Nobody knows where that is. So <laughs> I moved into Phoenix, worked at a commission salon for about a year, built a full, like, curly book, and then I'm in a studio now. Wow. Yeah, I've been all over. I mean, I've worked like mobile. I've done bridal. I've worked like out at Coachella and done like hair for people. I work at a lot of our EDM festivals now. We do like braid bars, which is really cool. So I'm all over the place. 
That's pretty dope. Yeah, I love it, though. It keeps me so excited and inspired. And it's always nice, too, to do hair somewhere because of the perks you get. Like, I get into the shows for free to go and do braids for whatever amount of hours, and I can hear everything that's going on. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's that's been cool. cool. Did you, when you were, at, and, and I'm pretty sure Alter's changed a little bit, but when yeah. you first started Alter, was there a lot of, like, continuing education yeah. inside the building and stuff? Yeah, there, there, I feel like, for me, at least, from the time period I've been doing hair, there always has been. Um, and it was always open opportunity if you wanted to take it. And I think that most of the stylists, at least when I was there, were very interested in the education, too. That was a big reason I went there, was I knew they had a lot of continuing education mm -hmm. and also, like, their pay scale, too. Like, they they are good about you at least getting a paycheck, even if you don't make enough of commission, which was really important to me, too. Hmm. I mean, that's a that's a bonus or yeah. a win, if you're, certainly if you're a stylist coming up. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by Ulta because... When they first got into the space, like the entire industry was like, you know, right. You know, d don't get anywhere near our industry. But they've done this great job of, of now we don't even think of them as anything other than a pro space. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, big shout out to Nick and, and, and his whole team yeah. as well for, for really doing that. And the other t the other company that's done that uh, well and they just like doubled down on it is Dyson. I think Dyson was yeah. just kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Like and now. Um, we're gonna have Danielle on a little bit later okay. today, and she um, she's gonna talk about uh, you know the, the Dyson Pro, which so now they're creating a pro team as well. Yeah, I saw that, and I'm pretty interested in that too. Just th I love seeing that, and I'm always so inspired by the Ulta team specifically, and it's the same relation for me. I'm like, man, back when I was with Ulta, we like took education, but I didn't imagine that this would be where they would be, and I think it's so cool. It just yeah. shows you wherever you want to go. Yeah, and, and, and it's great by them making the effort to to be involved and become a industry-based company, uh, industry-based product like Dyson and uh, you know and, and and we you know we would adopt them into the community into right. the pro community, you know, and there's so many other like like you'll see like beauty uh, supply shops that are not pro, they carry all the generic brands or whatever, you know. And but and you do get the the, the Dysons and the and the Altas, you know what I mean? It, they're really making an effort to, because they're elevating the hairdressers as well. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That's the difference. It just shows you great leadership, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but 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 both of those companies entered through the consumer. Yeah. Into the pro, right? Because yeah. because like, the other uh, most companies that we deal with are pro to consumer, right? And this is consumer to pro. So I just, I applaud it. I think I think it's really really cool. You I know? think it is too. I it, feel like it's like. Are there any other companies that you can think of that d have done that? No. Consumer now to pro. No, now that you've said that. Mm -mm. Yeah. I mean, like, Babelis is technically Con Air, maybe, yeah. but 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 they created a whole different company that's going to be a, a prosumer um, line as opposed right. to, like, you know, like Dyson, again, starting out as a consumer product. Yeah, and but I think you've all of them been pro to consumer, though, right? Like, wall, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's so that I just I'm fascinated. I by know that, that I love stuff thing. I love things that are outside of the box, outside of the ordinary. Because it's like, who's the person that thought of that? Like, I want to I want to talk to that person. I want to yeah. know their brain. That you were like, we are going to go. We're going to double down. We're going to make this the best professional space. And then they did it. And they did it right. right. And hired the right people to do it. You exactly. Know, you know, like I think Nick's amazing. You know, yeah. every one of that team is amazing. Yeah. But but just Nick kind of be the. I kind of see him as like the head of Avengers. I like like yeah. he's Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. Iron Man of, 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 of the Ulta team. Of he's the, the Ulta Avengers. The yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. literally, yeah. Right. Exactly. yeah. And all of them are killer. Uh, yes. You know, yeah. all of them are sweet as can be too. Yeah, you know, yeah. the talent on the it's yeah it's like unmatched. But but talent. what's amazing? I don't know why we're gonna get stuck on Ulta, but we're gonna get stuck on. Ulta. <laughs> we're here now. We're here now. <laughs> what was she worked for Ulta? That's it. <laughs> but, but I started it. Up. Yeah. I started it. <laughs> What's amazing is that they're all incredible artists, mm -hmm. but they're also relatable too. Yeah. Right? A lot of times I find though, like you'll you'll meet, I don't want to use Naha necessarily, but you'll meet. We'll use Naha as an example, but I don't, actually don't think th of this of Naha. But yeah. you'll meet like people that have done like these incredible campaigns and stuff. But it's just not. It's, it's like oh, that's neat, but it's yeah. but it's not relatable. Like everybody on the Ulta team is relatable, and, and their work is is insane. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it, but, but it's the way that I feel about it. But I feel like it comes because they were consumer to professional, too. I feel like that mm. space of really being personable, being in the salon that has a bunch of consumers there, like that really taught me how to get clients, how to talk to people about hair, because there was always people in the store. So you just had to convert them. 
And so it gives you this space of authenticity to just have conversation with people, tell them what you do, and it's not too much pressure. Right. Yeah. Right. So we, we worked at a hair salon, and um, in the early 90s, it was pre-Ulta, mm -hmm. but in the early 90s, they doubled down on having a huge retail area. You had to walk through this huge retail area to get to the salon. Yeah. You know, and then and, um, I thought it was genius then, and then when Ulta mm -hmm. came down, I was like, eh, let's make that space Walmart. Right. <laughs> right. right. Like, <laughs> let's, let's do a Walmart and have one chair. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, like, wow. Like that, and I, I, to be honest, I think that, that was my rejection of it at first. Like, well, mm -hmm. you're just like, you're loopholing this. Mm -hmm. You know, you're loopholing this license thing. But, but yeah. you know, fast mm -hmm. forward to now, like, you're like, yeah, they're geniuses. Yeah, That's well, and most of the people when I was there, that was 15 years ago, right at the beginning of my career, nobody knew we had a salon in the store. Yeah. yeah, people would be like, "Oh, we didn't know there was." I'm like, "Yeah, there's. We have an esthetician. Like, come by. You got it Let all. me book you. When are you available?" Right. And so, yeah, people I think just really caught on to the idea. But it's nice to be able to go to the salon, pick up everything else that you need, and then you're still in a shopping center to where you can go get groceries or everything else too. Just makes how, it so convenient, lifestyle wise. How is that like as a, as a ha hairstylist, like working there? Like everything's on the shelf there. Like, and also you yeah. have the. Well, let me ask him, uh, uh, form it as a question. Did you have the option to recommend any product on the shelves? We did, but we also used Redken when I was in the salon. So it was like the products that we used in the salon were Redken. So typically, I'd just walk them over to the shelf and get them so what the we Redken used shelf, for Redken. Yeah. yeah, but if they had, I've always been someone that's like, if you're not going to get what I'm recommending, but you're going to get something that's going to help your hair, especially in that space when there's so many products, like, okay, this will also help if it's, a budget issue or maybe you've used it and you don't like it or it's an ingredient allergy something like that it was nice at ulta because you had so many options to be like okay well i'll take the extra five minutes ten minutes and we'll talk about something else that's what that that's what i've found Smart. nice about the sweet life is yeah. is that i can recommend what i think is good for your hair not necessarily what brand thinks is good for yeah. your hair which yeah. has been really like oh well, yeah we can use this and oh and we can even cocktail these that's fine right you know what i mean right. and and not not hearing the uh the 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 corporate like mm -hmm. you can't you what you can and can't do you know? it's so crazy how mind blown your clients are when you're like no you don't have to use the shampoo conditioner and the stylers from all the same brand and they're like what what <laughs> exactly. like you can use this shampoo this conditioner right. and this styling product if you choose to it's whatever's going to work best in your hair and for what you're going for and so yeah being in a suite being independent really does help that Helps out a lot, right? Yeah, and, and 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 it seems like it's a more personal recommendation as well. Yeah, and it I sounds think like flexibility to me. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It really does, right? Well, I yeah. think in the industry as a whole, yeah, then your sweet life yeah. has changed a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and I mean that wasn't even as big in the beginning of my career. Like it was a thing, but I didn't expect it to be what it is now. By it's any very means. new yeah. in our area. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, not very new, but the last 10 years or so, like we're the rest of the country. Like, yeah. you know, Eric has a thousand like chairs in L.A., you know, yeah. it's still on the public, you know. Yeah. So but uh, for, for us, it's 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 I fairly feel, new. I feel like it's definitely a West Coast lifestyle, though. Like it's very much so like, yeah, come and go and not really wanting to have a boss flexibility sure <laughs> yeah. everything they sell everything they sell tony yes right i think tony owns a suite yeah. <laughs> so how did you like uh like you said that you were kind of in the suburbs but then you wanted to focus on texture hair yeah. how did you it's kind of ballsy right yeah like, like kind of how did you find that that this was going to be your trajectory um that's a really great question i just the, the two main cities that I feel like in Arizona that people are getting their hair done is probably Phoenix and Scottsdale in the span of like where the most salons are, where people are going to look. And I'm just a more Phoenix kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. I feel like I really love that my clients, if I wanted to hang out with any of them, I probably could. Or if we were going to grab lunch after an appointment, like that relatability I love. And I feel like the Phoenix demographic has a little more diversity than the Scottsdale demographic. So it really decided for me. But I got on social media and was like, I actually was listening to Gina Bianca. I followed her for a long time. Sure, and so you. one of her things that she always was like, well, if you're going to move and you have no social media presence, how are you going to move? And so I doubled down on social media and I just started to DM people that had curly hair. I found some pages like in Arizona. There was one that was an Arizona page that highlighted a lot of people with curly hair. And I just started to message them and ask them to come in, offered them half off an appointment. But in that message, I also made them aware that I'd be making content. And that was more so for me because I wasn't really doing a lot of content. So it got rid of the, 
oh, the appointment's over. Am I going to ask them? Am I not? Like, maybe they don't want to take a photo. They were already prepared and very right. willing to do so. And so I just, I posted like three times a day and I had a full book in like six months. Whoa, wow. really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It was really cool, actually. And I was the only one at the salon. We had some other people doing curls, but the guests that I would go after and the people on Instagram had the huge curls, lots of volume. So I was the only one in the salon really doing that type of hair, too. So that just helped funnel. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. We just last last week, we um, at our hair show, Presley Poe and Friends, we had hair by Rima. Yes. She was one of our educators. Yes. And it, it, was, it was kind of, it was... I, the word isn't interesting because that sounds disrespectful, it, it, but mm. the way that she approached the w- unique, yes. you know, in the way that she, and I go, oh, this makes sense. Like, as she's teaching, you're like, oh, I get why, yeah. he, I get why her imagery is what her imagery is. Cause I was yes. in awe. Yeah. yeah. I was in awe. Like, when she's out there taking the pictures and the model's beautiful, the hair's beautiful, yep. and it's like, that, just like how, <laughs> like, right. it's, uh, it, she, it, she was amazing. Yeah. It is, I feel like I'm more creative working on texture because I'm doing more sculpting. I'm working on more of a 3D shape and shifting and transitioning really, I was super burnt out. Like I was at a point to where it was like, am I still gonna do hair? But what else do I wanna do? What else would I do? And so it really shifted and sparked that creativity in me again. And has allowed me to just like take every client like a sculpture or like I get to play and be creative because they don't really know. You know, I was just thinking- for what is going on either. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that like, Doing like these big, great curls is probably closer to barbering than it is hairdressing, yeah. because you're kind of creating, you're kind of sculpting in shape, and you're and you're seeing it as a shape as opposed to a technique. Mm-hmm. Is, is, yeah. that, is that fair? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask I you. Like I mean, he the, doesn't care. I, I feel <laughs> like from the standpoint of kind of going for the overall shape and whatever you're gonna do in between to get there, versus mm-hmm. this is this haircut. This is the sectioning. You do this the same way every single time. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Man, it, it's so cool to kind of watch, certainly in the last five years, how yeah. curly hair has like just exploded. Yes. Right. Oh, and like, yeah. And like the looks that we're seeing. I mean, like it, just the work that we see now is just incredible. It Ridiculous. Is. It's, it's insane. It's, it really it's is. Yeah. beautiful. It's well, the stuff that makes me excited, like 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 barbering did five yeah. years ago. Like yeah. it, it's like whoa, like, yeah, that's cool. Well, when you see it too, or you watch someone do it, I feel like especially if you're a hairstylist, it clicks too. It's not something yeah. that's a complete reinvention of the wheel. You're just taking the techniques that you know and applying them in a different way. And so you watch it, and I watch so many people like in classes that I teach that I can see the light bulb go off in their head, and I'm like, yes, I got, got it. You. nailed it. Yes, I nailed got it. you. <laughs> But I, mic drop. I'm done with the class. <laughs> I think we need to do better, better um, in our schools, in, yes. our, in, in, in our in our hair schools, in our cosmetology schools, our barbering schools. That you know what I mean. Right now, we it, uh, it's pretty much just straight hair mannequins, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I know when we were in hair school, we didn't learn anything about curly hair. No, you know, mm-hmm. so uh, you know we're trying to play catch up. You know, I mean? yeah. we're so far behind. But I think if you're in in school, they should teach you. You know, all the different hair textures, Mm -hmm. you know, right now is just a a straight fabric. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think you're doing these kids uh, uh, unfair justice to to just keep them, you know what I mean, on that path. I mean, we need to, if we're growing as a... As a society, we need to grow our schools, too, yeah. and, ma- and make uh, us better hairdressers starting off. Right. Yeah. Well, and the unfortunate part that I've encountered, because at this space, traveling, working, all the things, I'm like, okay, I want to get in the community. I want to serve my community. What better way to do it than go into a hair school, teach a demo, show them what is going on? Most of the students in most of the schools that I go to are like, well, they said we were going to learn this. And that was what happened when I went to school, too. I also had one of my best friends in beauty school go through 1,600 hours of cosmetology thinking that she was going to learn how to do makeup. So there's this whole, <laughs> like, discrepancy in what we're told that we're going to learn and what we're actually learning. But all the students are so interested and intrigued because, first of all, like, 60% of them have some sort of curl. Like, most of them have curly hair. Right. But they're seeing it as this up-and-coming thing in the industry, and they want to get into that piece of it. Yeah. So getting it into schools. Some schools are better than others. It's just so difficult. I feel like I would love to see us have some sort of connection between cosmetology, even through states in our country. So then 
if you go to this school and you have these hours, but then you go somewhere else and you move and you want to take like a specialized texture course, like all of that joins together. All that makes sense. Yeah. Same thing with continuing education. Arizona doesn't have any continuing education hours. Maryland, so d- we're in Maryland and Maryland um, during co right before COVID, they required it mm-hmm. and then they pulled it off during COVID because, you know, they yeah. were just like, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? But, you know, back to the hair schools and we went to hair school in the early nineties yeah. is that yes, we use like, you know, straight hair mannequins and stuff. But if I'm remembering correctly, like still like the African American uh, students, they were still doing like hot combs and they were yeah. still doing like, like, and I don't. I don't know if they were trained. I, I don't recall that that much, but I, I remember seeing it. Yeah. You know, and, and, but, if, and, but, but they were. So it's not even just the school, but it's actually the schools. It's not just the curriculum. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. But the schools are now segregating into like, oh, well, you're African American, you can do this. Right, and so that's what happened to me too. And I was like, I'm not going to do every relaxer that walks through the door because I know how to do it. I think because you mean a perm. Yeah, I'm not doing all the terms. <laughs> I've been trained, retrained my brain so well. Uh, but it is, there's a lot of cultural hair experience that you get being in the black community. Same thing with like Latino community too. I feel like mm-hmm. the like Dominican blowouts and the smoothing and stuff like that. My mom used to hot comb my hair on the stove when I was growing up. So it'd be like wash day, blow it out, take me to the kitchen. Yeah. So I knew how to do it coming into beauty school. So then they would just filter those people. But what about everybody else that wants to learn? Or what about me that wants to learn a different hair texture and do something different too? So I think in that space, the curriculum's the curriculum, but you're always going to get those people that come in that you're like, okay, well, we're going to learn on them today. And that's kind of what they're there for and just making it equal opportunity for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I already know how to do it, I don't need to take everybody that comes in with that service because I already know how to do it. I wanted, there's this, I think Denzel Washington talked about, Mm -hmm. talked about this and he was talking about the, uh, the African American hair, not culture necessarily, yeah. but experience. I think yeah. is that, and he talked about that. And he goes, "You're not going to get it unless you smell this in the kitchen." Yeah, you know, like like, uh-huh. like from 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 a relaxer and yeah. stuff. You know, and anyway, I I feel like if it, if I if we had a real production here, we would like cue in this quote right now, right. or cue <laughs> in this clip right now. Yes. It, it, it was it was it was it was crazy because he was talking about. I think he was talking about the difference between like having a white director in this role, you know, yeah. b- whether it's Spike Lee or whatever. I don't know if he was yeah. talking necessarily about Malcolm X, but um, but how, like, like no, an African-American director is going to get this experience because they can smell it. Yeah. Or there was some kind of, like, thing about uh, thing about that, yeah. and I remember watching that going, like, oh, that, that makes sense. Well, and I feel like that's why a lot of my guests that I have are my guests, because they can get a pretty good haircut in other places, but the styling aspect, the oils conversation in the curl space right now is so big too oh let's have that well so it's you're using a lot of oils in your hair that are heavy a lot of raw oils even like hairdresses which is something that you would use on your scalp before you hot comb for example or then to blow out and you curl whatever it's going to be but those oils are blocking the water from getting in so i like to tell my guests if you're going to have a salad that you have at home and you wash that bowl out but you had balsamic vinaigrette in it the oil and the water beat apart so your hair is never really getting hydrated, which is why you don't think you have any curls. It's not that you don't have curl. You're not getting water into your hair. But when you're wearing your hair straight, if you're using a hot comb on the stove, what temperature is it? Who knows, right? 400 to 550 maybe? Like, who knows? But those really thick, heavy oils are buffering your hair. So culturally, you learn that, but you learn that for a different style. With this style, now we don't utilize all of that because you're not getting the water that you need. When we were wearing our hair straight... We're like a cat with water. When you are wearing your hair curly, you need, you're like a fish. You need so much more water in your hair. So that people don't know how to speak to that because they've never had that experience. So I teach a lot of that. When I teach, I'm like, let's dive in. Like, what do you want to know about? I make sure I hit or try to hit, if I'm thinking about it, those cultural experience things because I want to prepare other stylists also to be able to take whatever type of clientele. I don't want anybody that thinks that because they're black, because they're Hispanic, they have to go to that type of salon because most black salons in my area cannot do my hair when it's in its natural state either. So Well, I'm going to tell you that uh, uh, that's the first time I've heard that in your analogies. Like, the light bulb. You, did you see the light bulb yeah. go up? Yeah. yeah. I was yes. like, uh-huh. like, oh. That, that makes, makes so much sense. Uh-huh. I mean, my head, I was like, wow. It's the first time I'm able to really literally see that. Yeah. Well, and it's a hard conversation to approach. And then people outside of that experience don't want to have the conversation 
But as a hairstylist, you're just working backwards because every time they come in, they're not going to be getting the results that they want to get. But you don't want to tell them that they can't use it because they're telling you that that's what they've grown up using and their grandma and their mom and all those things. And it's like, yeah, I get that. But that's just not the style you have right now. If you want to wear it straight, use your oil. If you don't, don't use don't the oil. Use oil. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, that, that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little awestruck by that. that yeah. It, what a great, great analogy. Thank you. I like the fish and the cat, too. Yeah. yeah. That, <laughs> was, that was on the spot. That was, <laughs> right. no, that, yeah, that was, that was, that was inspired I'm, by you all. Yeah. I, I'm kind of thinking if you come up with a product line, you call it fish and cat. Yeah. Right. You know, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And the, the balsamic vinaigrette fish. was a good one, too. I was like, that oh, one, I can uh, see I that. I that one. I have one a good product. one for scalp cleanliness, too. We'll go over okay, that. go ahead. Okay. So a lot of people, too, culturally... When you're wearing your hair straight, you're washing your hair once a week, maybe once every two weeks, or going to the salon to get it done. But so many black women have scalp problems and hair loss issues, right? Well, your scalp's not clean. You're only washing it once or twice a month. So I also will tell people, for one, if you want your hair to be hydrated and curly, you need the most amount of water in it. If you're only washing it once a week, you only have 52 opportunities to get water into your hair. So how long is that going to take you to get that moisture level that you want. But also with your scalp, if you didn't wash your arm for two weeks, what would it look like? It's still skin, it has to be clean. Like you would have some sort of rash, some sort of something, somebody wouldn't want to touch you there because it would be funky. That's what's going on on your scalp. Mm. So what's your recommendation for that? Wash your hair. How wash often? Your hair. Um, most of my guests, especially because we're in a more dry climate, probably every four to five days. So under a week for me is better in between that four to seven day mark. I feel like, we start to use utilize a lot of products to combat the things that are happening because our scalp needs to be clean versus just cleaning our scalp. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're good at this, man. I am. Yeah. That's really good. Thank yeah. you. We're, Thank we're you. Preach. I mean, it's like, I feel like I'm at a university in school. I'm getting a <laughs> lesson right now because it's yeah. I mean, university of Phoenix. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and they hire me next week. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it all makes so much sense. Yeah. But yeah, I guess, you know, when, when you get in routines or when you get mm -hmm. into things that, you know what I mean, it's that's how it's always been. That's how you accept it. Right. You're right? not questioning it because yeah. your whole family has done it that way. Your whole bloodline has done it that way. Sure. Yeah. It's almost DNA. It, it is. And it really it, and even like the heavy butters or the heavy um, oils to use when you hot comb, that comes from slavery times. Like the only things that we could put in our hair and had was like left like pig fat. Right. Like so. Lord. Exactly. And so that transitioned into something different and it got updated slightly, but it comes from almost like a DNA space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were talking about the scalp problems and immediately I thought about Madam CJ Walker, right? Yeah. That what she was, that's what she was trying to cure yep. or, or hair loss and stuff. Yeah. Well. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, it's so, it's so cool. It, it's also, it, it's cool and not like even for you to say that it came from slavery time, just like how short and how long, like 150 years is. Yeah. You know, yeah. because it's only like it's, it's three lifetimes, right? It's right. Three generations, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, it's wild. It is crazy. It's mm -hmm. crazy to think. And I think people think that it was so far away when it really wasn't either. But I mean, that's all marketing propaganda. Like you see pictures of Dr. Martin Luther King in black and white, right? Like you don't see photos of him in color and you think, OK, that was so long ago. It wasn't. The photos are just in black and white. Oh, sure. Right. 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 I went there in Memphis, by the way. I went to the, uh, the Luray, uh, is it Luray? Ho the motel. Yeah. Which is now the uh, Civil Rights Museum. Yeah. Have you been there? No, I haven't been. There. I was just going to say, how was, I have not been there yet. It's extraordinary. You I, know, you, you, yeah. The, the museum. So it's like a typical like motel. Yeah. First off, let me, let me clear every, or not cl clear for myself. Right. It's like, I've seen the photos of you know him sitting on the balcony there. Yeah. I assumed it was a suburb somewhere. Because, because in my brain, like, motels aren't in the inner city. Yeah. Right? In yeah. my brain, those are, like, in, like, you know, suburbs or right outside, like, mm -hmm. whatever that. Right no, off a highway somewhere. Exactly, yeah. right? So this is right in the city. You know, Lorraine. Lorraine Motel. Yeah. Um, it, so it's right in the city. So, you know, and then you're also thinking, like, how do you get off a shot? You know, now you're sitting right. in the city, and you're like, how do you get off a shot here? Right. You know what I mean? Here's what's cool about the museum is they, it was a typical like L-shaped museum, right? And they've built up the back of it so it's a whole civil rights museum, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just doing, and you're going through the entire African ex African American experience in the, like you start off with like, you know, people uh, rowing into America, right? Yeah. And then you, you kind of walk through that. Um, and then like, you're just going through the museum, you walk up these steps and you're literally in his bed in the room that he was in. That's so crazy. And it's like, 
whoa. And not only that, but you're over, because he stayed in that room right outside where he was assassinated. So, yeah. like, you're sitting right there, and it just brings every, and the room's exactly the same as it was in 1968. And it's just, it's amazing. Just, it's just this really emotional, like, yeah. Oh, all of that, and like this is this is this this is the reality that we land in. Mm. You know, it, it was cool, and it was and because I didn't know we were going to the room. I didn't. We just walked up. We're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. It, it's a very similar experience to like when you go to the Vietnam Memorial. Mm. Like there's like there's just like it has its own energy, mm-hmm. and you know, and and I don't know if you bring the energy, or if the energy's just there, but it just has this its own its own energy. You mm-hmm. know, I think the energy's there. I think it's yeah. it's that, and it's the the knowing of what happened in the space too kind of keeps the energy there like you already are like this wasn't the best scenario when you get in there it's like wow this room this is a normal room this could like he didn't know that was going to happen right. obviously like it's just staying in a motel room that, that, you know what that's yeah. exactly what you think about like yeah. three seconds before you shot he was standing right there he was coming through that doorway yeah you know what i mean yeah. and, and just to kind of experience that and like oh and jesse jackson was here right 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 like, it, 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 it was a, it was a I don't want to say cool experience, you know, uh, yeah. that's the easy word to go to, but it was an experience, you yeah. know, and it was like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, it just, I think it makes it real. And also what they did too is the cars that were in the parking lot are still in the parking lot. Oh, wow. So they've kind of, they, they've created, so when you're looking at it from the top, you're yeah. in 1968. If that that's, makes sense. It's not yeah. like modern cars yeah, or anything no, like that. Insane. It's the cars from, f- that were that's there. That's crazy. I was yeah. just, and wow. see, this is like the thing that I'm always thinking of. It's like, who thought to put the cars there? Like, who was that person that was like, this needs to feel like that time and space? Yeah. What's weird about it is that until they opened it as a memorial, like th- I'm pretty sure the Smithsonian it backed a lot of it, mm-hmm. but until they made it a memorial, it was a, like, a, a it, they turned it into like an apartment complex, but it was for like, Poor people, you know, like yeah. there were motel rooms, you know, so yeah. for them to be able to recreate all of that. And, and then I'm thinking, like, who lived in there for 20 years? Right. Who lived in that same room? Right. That Dr. King was in, you know, like, like yeah. I think about that, too, and, like, what, what that must mean um, or what that must be like, you know. You're right. Or if they, like, you have to, well, you don't have to know if they knew, right? But I feel like in that space, Listen, in that area, I've you never have seen to a know, motel right? that has that same corner. Yeah. You know, like where, where Dr. King yeah. was, st- was standing, like, you've got to know. Right. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm in this room. I'm in this room. And someone could probably assassinate me because it's <laughs> happened before. <laughs> so There's actually a woman that's protested every single day from like 1979 that sits in front of there oh, prote- wow. yelling at everyone, you know, talking about, you know, Memphis and the Smithsonian, how, how they wronged people, yeah. you know. But oh. she, because I think she lived in that building, mm. and she's protesting that she was like, I think she was the last one, like, like to put out, yeah, yeah put, and she would yeah. apparently put out, right, <laughs> right. I mean, I'm sure she was asked a thousand <laughs> times, but well, she, I mean, she's still showing up every day. So is she? Has she even left? <laughs> like, right. she no, she doesn't live there anymore. Left. <laughs> you can definitely Google search this woman that sits outside oh, wow. of the Royal Ray Motel. There, it's cool. It was a, yeah. it was a cool experience though. Like, it, uh, like the whole Memphis thing was very cool to me, mm-hmm. just from um, so much of the African American experience. Um, happened in, in yeah. Memphis, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was really cool. Beale, you've been to Beale Street, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like just the Beale Street and like, yeah. oh man, this is this is the place, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is the blues, you mm-hmm. know. In the salon, Tony and I listen to the blues all the time, so um, I, 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 I feel connected to it, but but I really yeah. dig the blues and I dig it. It's actually funny, like I've gone in and out of the blues. I'm talking a lot. Oh. I, I apologize. I go in and out of the blues every every few years. Yeah. And this year, this time around, it's like a di- I'm it's different now. Yeah, you it's know? like I feel it different. Settled into just like where you are and who you are. I, yeah, like, I think I, that that's it. Well, you need yeah. to go on the blues cruise with uh, our <laughs> client. Yes, <laughs> the blues cruise. I love that. I'm very I'm like that too. I have music like talent, I guess in my family. So my great grandfather was You got was a mic? Girl, my, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 not me. Not me. <laughs> y'all y'all maybe wouldn't even want me to sing happy birthday, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but my great grandfather was a jazz clarinetist. And then my grandmother was married to someone that was a jazz like art musician too. So whenever I listen to jazz, I'm like, why don't I listen to this more? Kind of like what you're saying, the in and out of the blues. And now I'm like, okay, it could be solidified. I can keep. Did they play here in Chicago? Um, my great grandfather didn't actually because it was during the civil rights time. So he was in Europe. He played in Switzerland because he was a lot more fair skin. Like on our census report of him, it says he's mulatto, which means mm-hmm. that he was lighter. Mi- they thought he was mixed with something. Right. So he was able to get away with a little bit more in Europe versus being here. That's well, a Josephine Baker story, right? Yep. 
you know? Mm -hmm. she, she went to Europe and, and blew up and became Josephine Baker. Right, well, right. and my great-grandfather, his name's Albert Nicholas, same thing. He was pretty big out there. And then my grandmother, her sister, was married to Billy Eckstein. Wow. Yeah. Well, you do got it, girl. Give this Man. girl a horn. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe an instrument, not the voice, maybe an instrument. <laughs> Pull in a, a piano or something, I could probably do that. Mary had a little lamb real quick, right. twinkle, twinkle, little star. That's can about where I'm at. Can I tell you a story? Yes. I'm in seventh grade. I don't, know if I've, I don't think I've told this story on the podcast before. I'm in seventh grade, and we had to do a musical instrument, right? So, mm -hmm. like, I wanted to do drums like every seventh, seventh grade boy, right? Right. wanted to do drums and make a lot of noise, um, but they forced me to do the trumpet. So I do the, I, I, we rent a trumpet, you know, and, you know, mm. my, my family certainly wasn't rich or anything, you know, yeah. so like everything was a struggle, you know, um, yeah. to be, so we rented this trumpet for the whole school year, you know, right. so I'm in my second class <laughs> in band and I play Mary Had a Little Lamb and the teacher literally goes, that's the worst rendition of Mary Had a Little <laughs> Lamb I've ever, I packed up my trumpet, I walked across the hallway, which is the guidance counselor and I transferred out of that class and we had this trumpet sitting in the house for, you know, the entire school year <laughs> and every time like my parents came in and they would like, you know, connect to the trumpet, they would like give me the eye or they'd give me the, mm -hmm. the shit about like, we, <laughs> we rented that thing for the <laughs> entire year and you did one class. No, and see, that's terrible too. Like you could have been the next trumpet like aficionado if that teacher didn't tell you that it probably wasn't that bad <laughs> i mean <laughs> he's got a lot <laughs> he's had a lot of students that's true, that's true. <laughs> yeah that's true when you think about it maybe that's maybe. the worst rendition of marriott but how do you like, do it back <laughs> but i mean you still kind of get at first place at being the worst right you're like you're what was the quote we heard yesterday? Nobody wants to be first and nobody wants to be second. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be first. No, that's true. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then you're last because it was the worst. Well, this is good. <laughs> I, know, I know there was somebody in his future and then he said, this is the second worst rendition of Mary <laughs> Yeah, uh, and then they're second. That's, that's the worst. You're the second worst. Like, you couldn't even be the worst. How, how are you doing that? Oh, my gosh. That Man, is so funny. That is so funny. I... Yeah, my mom played piano and, like, played in the church and, like, organ, like, had all these hymns and stuff. So they funneled me in and forced me to play piano, which I hate it. Like, they didn't let many. you do chorus, though? I did do chorus. Actually, when I lived here, I did chorus. So I was at a Montessori school, and we used to sing at the Children's Museum over at Navy Pier. Nice. Mm-hmm. But we were all together. I would need my background <laughs> singers <laughs> if you guys want me to sing. No. I can yeah, do an accompaniment here, man. I'm like, what are we, no, I'm just kidding. Like, what are we going to sing? Mary Had a Little Lamp? No. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Have you noticed that, like, uh, uh, happy, as you get older, happy birthday, like, the normal happy birthday song yeah. gets longer and slower? Yes. Goes, happy birthday. I'm like, can we speed this up? No, see. <laughs> we got cake to eat. See, we need the Stevie Wonder version, the yeah. happy birthday, birthday to you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's in and out quick, and it's like, don't, nobody knows the second verse, so right. it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Three the words, candle. right? Exactly. <laughs> yep, that's yeah, what it, I always leave it sounds like a, like a death instead of a happy birthday. Right, right? it's not. Happy birthday. birthday. Right, we're all sad. You're <laughs> sad. <laughs> we don't want to be here. We're not celebrating you at all. We're yeah. just here. We just want the cake. Right. <laughs> Bring the cake out. We're dying. We need sugar. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, you're up. right, though. The Stevie Wonder version's way better. Love it. Oh, you know? I love it. And I, like, have to sing it. So if I'm singing Happy Birthday and it's a regular one, Oh, I you like break into Stevie. Uh, afterwards. You close your eyes first? Afterwards. <laughs> yeah, right? I'll, like, connect with someone else when I start, and I'm like, oh, you know it? Mm. We're doing it. We're doing it. Who doesn't better. know that version? Uh, you know, you never know. We're doing. But <laughs> it was something that I felt like in my mind was so much more cultural than it was. At least okay. growing up, because we like a lot of times we wouldn't even sing like the traditional happy birthday. It'd just be Stevie Wonder. Right. So now it's cool to see places where it's both. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you have I, to you have to pep it up with yeah. the second one. You, you know, um, what's the ba the Baby Shark song? Yes. Sing that in the happy sing Happy Birthday in that tune. Happy birthday, the original one. The Happy yeah. Birthday song. Sing it in that tune. It's much better. You sing it. I'm like trying to think of the tune. What's the tune? Um, Baby shark. Do, 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 do. Happy birthday to you. Do, do, do. Happy <laughs> birthday to you. Oh, Much yeah. better. That is Much a lot better. better. Okay. Okay. Right? I can see that. I can see that in the future. I yeah, feel like our... Gen Z will be, right. that'll be their version <laughs> of Happy Birthday because they all grew up with Baby Shark. You know, like Stevie who? Right, yeah. honestly. Oh no, poor Stevie. Poor Sorry, Stevie. Stevie. Poor Stevie. <laughs> Man, I love Stevie. I, well, that'll I make do. Stevie's song look slow. Oh, we can't have right. that. Do, 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 do. That's right. We can't have that. That's the peppy one. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, now we'll be singing Stevie Wonder instead of the first. We'll just like shift and transition. Stevie go. Wonder will come first, then yeah. it'll be the Baby Shark Happy <laughs> Birthday. <laughs>
And uh, the Beatles have one too, right? They have a happy birthday song. Do they do. Yeah, you've heard it. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll, yeah, no, again, Q and Beatles version now. Right. <laughs> Pay Apple Music. That's awesome. Martina, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you so, so much it's for having awesome. me. It's been great. You guys are the first yeah. podcast that I, like, hair centered podcast that I listened to. So it's really great to be on here and just hang out. That's yeah. it. It's yeah. a hang. It's I a like hang. That. It's a hang. Yeah. Yeah. Tell the number. No, it doesn't matter. What do you remember the first podcast you heard of ours? You know, I don't, but I feel like it was. It, I'm the person that like finds a podcast and goes through and listens to the beginning, but they, it was in the beginning. It was probably maybe like 10 podcasts deep. So mm. I started at the first one, binged, and I would literally be like, it's my day off. I'm going to listen to it. <laughs> it's my day off. <laughs> it's my day, right. And then my day off, work on stuff. Genius, and yeah. Yeah it, yeah, it is really genius, actually. You know, the. the, the uh because we're releasing on Mondays, yeah. and traditionally that's always been the day of education for hairdressers. Yeah. That that that's where the name came from. Like right. your day off. This is your day off. Let's yeah. let's go. Let's go learn something. You know that that was kind of the the idea, the thought about it. Well, and the connection, at least for me, was instant. There, I'm like, it is my day off. How? <laughs> okay, they're hairstylists. They know. Like, let's <laughs> listen to this. What's going on? Well, we were the first hairdresser, and I know someone's probably going to kill us for it, but but we were the first pod hairdressing podcast that was um, hairdressers talking to hairdressers. Yeah. Right. Like Gordon had his, but his was definitely like brand based. Right. And then Eric had his and he was talking to, um, you know, people that were in the suites and, you know, I'm um, trying to fill the suites. You know, for mm -hmm. us, it was just like, let's talk about what happens on a Saturday afternoon. Right. You know, and th that, that was kind of not necessarily our angle, but it's the only thing we knew to talk about, you right. know, yeah. with that. And then, you know, people seemed to like it. So that's kind of how it happened. They 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 learned they learned to like it after episode ten though so I appreciate you uh, jumping in early with us. Oh yeah, I was there you before were there. episode ten. <laughs> we, we can totally understand the grind. Yeah, we're still grinding today. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been it's been great. Every I've learned about so many people, like experienced so many people, start to follow so many people from the podcast. So I'm a fan, yeah. always That's a cool. fan. Yeah. Well, 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 follow Martina. Um, and how can people follow you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Martina Nicholas underscore, and then that'll kind of filter everything else out. Um, but I didn't you just change your name? I though? just changed yeah, it when we, we were in we New York. We had a conversation in New York yeah, about it. Yeah, because I was on the fence about doing it. I had been under the um, handle for all curl kind with the number four. But again, it's like kind of shifting in different spaces, education, things like that. I wanted people to be able to find me really easy. But I also talk about other things. And like I love doing hair, but I also really love mindset. And like I feel like so many things that you get into with hair are because of your mindset. And I love wellness and I'm a yoga instructor. Do you think, so that's, an, do you think that's an Arizona thing? Pro maybe. Because yeah, it seems Maybe. like there's a lot of stuff that comes out of, like, we talked earlier, yeah. um, I guess before we went on, but just, like, the mountain time zone and how much how much we love that area. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of people that are from that region of the country are really into wellness and mindset and well, all that stuff. Well, and I feel like there wasn't a lot out there for such a long time, too. So when you don't have a lot to do, self-reflection is going to come naturally, I feel like. And if it's not, then... I, I, I my experience, our experience, because we've talked about it, is, like, mm -hmm. when... Like when we're in Yellowstone, like you're in a different mindset. So yeah. you're, you're like, it's so big and so overwhelming that you both feel like you're part of something larger. Yeah. And you feel insignificant. And it's this yes. very weird kind of like yin yang counterbalance kind of, at least that was. I always say that I love doing things that make me feel small. Mm. Because wow. then it really puts it into perspective. And I feel like being in spaces like that makes you automatically grateful. Because you're like, wow, like I'm yeah. not working or I can experience what this looks like. The na I can hear a bird chirping, like all these little things that you don't normally encounter. It just puts you in a different state of gratitude. I think even without you knowing that you're in that state of gratitude. I have a theory. Love that. A couple of years ago, we were at Elizabeth Faye's uh, Hair Love Retreat in Zion. Yeah. And we were sitting in the desert. Right. right. And we're looking up and it was the most beautiful sky I'd seen probably since I was a child. And I have a theory that light pollution was the start of our disconnection to earth mm. you know because mm -hmm. because on the east coast nowhere on the east coast can you see stars like we yeah. saw them in zion mm -mm. you know and, and and i think i totally get the constellation thing the constellation mm -hmm. fantasy i totally get the like outer space fantasy what fantasy not that it's a fantasy but you know yeah, what i'm yeah. saying but just all, all the all the all the religions that are based around it, all of the understanding and our understandings and the astrology of it or, or the, what's the other one? Anyways, I totally get that. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, because after you see it, you're like, oh, that's humbling. Yeah. 
you know, and you talk yeah. about being nothing now. Like if you kind of like think about it, like like a zoom out, like mm-hmm. yeah, where are you in this universe? Yeah, you know, you said that, and I thought of Men in Black, like that zoom out. And yeah, that I always love because I'm like, wow, like it really is like that, yeah. and it's crazy to think if you were running late this morning or you got in an argument with someone or whatever, and then you go sit out under the stars and you're like, what is really important about any of that? Mm -mm. Like, that's just so minuscule. Like those things will resolve themselves. I'll find a solution, but like living and just experiencing is so important. That's, that's, I mean, that is so spot on because like you, when we're out in Zion, just all your issues Mm -hmm. are so small Mm -hmm. in comparison. To, to, to all of that, you know yeah. what I mean? And, 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 and there's so much more than just you and your little feelings or my little feelings, and you know what I mean? I, you know, it, it humbles you. Yeah. It really does. I always feel like all when I'm in a space like that, it's like all my issues are man-made or like made by myself, and like this was something that was here before all of that. Yeah. So like if this can exist before, it'll exist after, and it'll work itself out the way it's supposed to. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'll just disintegrate into the earth. And right. <laughs> you know? I, I'm like... Make me into a tree. That's right. what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Bury my ashes and turn me into a tree, please, so that Should people can come out and look at me and be like awe inspired and have inspiration. Well, they can make that's you into a diamond now. You've I've seen, seen that. that. Yeah. yeah, I have seen that. I, and I, I don't mind that either. Actually. I, that's why I, I said, you know what? I told my wife, I said, you know, like if I die, turn me into a diamond, put me onto a crown. And then when you die, you get to come into the crown. And when our kid, like, we just create yeah. this family crest crown. You know? I like it. <laughs> cool. I like that. That's cool. I like it. That's that's I mean, it doesn't sound narcissistic at all. Right. But, you know, like, no. it, I like the idea. It's right. just building a family crest, right? Yeah. I like it. Exactly. I kinda, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to lie. I kind of dig that idea. Yeah. You know? I mean, it could go forever. That's like, better. It, that's my great, great grandfather's diamond right there. Right. Like, you know. I feel like that's better than like taxidermying your pets when they pass right. away. Right. Like yeah. that. I'm like, I'm on the fence about that one. The yeah. diamond I can get with. <laughs> what about the, uh, what about like uh, DNAing your pet? I had a friend that did that. And I feel like I have a, I have a blue nose pit bull and she's obviously a blue nose pit bull. So I would never have to, but my friend's dog that did, I don't even remember what type of dog that they were, but it, we would have never guessed. I was like, that kind of makes sense. I don't think that I would care that much about my dog. I've done my ancestry though, but I haven't. You've done done your ancestry. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ancestry.com. It's, I mean, it's very interesting to see too, when you click like the map and you're like, Oh, okay. Slave trade. There you go. Yeah. Like that's oh, that's how we got here. That's how we got here. Yep. But it's, it's cool to see. Where did your family come through? Do you know? Um, I know that we were originally like Georgia, Louisiana. So I have a lot of Creole influence. I don't know specifically where like Western Africa sure, sure, sure. is what my like genetics tell me, but yeah. In the South. Coute de bois. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How's your French? Uh, none. <laughs> no. Oui, oui. Merci. So, have you read it. the book? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, no music, no friends. <laughs> no friends. You let your family down. <laughs> I know. And you know what's funny is I will try, I do try to learn French, but when I lived here, actually, I went to Montessori school from like five to 10 or 11 when I moved to Arizona. So I've been speaking Spanish since I was five. So trying to speak French is the biggest jumble in my brain, but I can connect it. Like I can read it. Mm-hmm. If I can connect, like look at it and be like, okay, this is what that word is. But speaking it is just You're probably pretty more good. than me. <laughs> can you figure out like Italian too, reading it? Yeah. 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 It's Italian. I could listen to the first part of the Godfather and not have to watch the subtitles. Yeah. 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 My father-in-law get, could do that. Yeah. Not to get deep again, but I'm like, that's another, uh, this service, I think we do to uh to the to to the kids here, and, and not teach them another language. Yeah. You know, like all these other countries, they they know two, three, four languages. Mm-hmm. Proximity. Yeah. You know uh, exactly. That is it, though, right? Because it's like, where are we gonna go to yeah. learn it? Or we don't have to. Tra- we don't travel anywhere. You can't just hop on a train and go somewhere else right. that speaks a different language. <laughs> I wish that would be yeah. great. I don't yeah. know. I mean, th- th- there's some pretty good uh, dialects around the country that you're like. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't sound like English. Right. That ain't my right. English. <laughs> right. No, exactly. Like, go ahead. Take a trip down south. See if you can understand anything. Because I, I have some friends from New Orleans, and I'm like, I need. don't talk to me on the phone. I need to see you in person because I don't know what you're saying right now. Fair awesome. enough. Yeah. Have you read the book uh, uh, written by Clint Smith? It's called How the Word Was Passed. No. Put it on. If okay. you're listening, gonna, put, it's, yeah. a, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. It's about... Um, uh, he visited um, 12 different like areas that had to do with the American slave trade, mm-hmm. and it, it's absolutely fascinating. And he, he, by trade, I guess, or by job, he's a poet. It's not okay. a poetry book, yeah. right? But um, his, his poetic observations 
are amazing. The way that he sets the stage, the way that he brings you in yeah. is really cool. And it's like such a like an education thing. But what's really, really great about Clint too is that he goes into these places with no prejudice. Mm. Like he's there to learn, mm -hmm. you know. And it's really neat how how even like when he's had confrontation with people, he doesn't really confront them. He'll correct them in in the writing, but yeah. not in in the story. Like, yeah, this guy believed this. However, he edited out all that we know about. Mainly about yeah. st mainly about uh, uh, state rights and stuff, and oh, like okay. how how there's this movement now um, in some of the southern states. How the the reason for the Civil War was for state rights, mm -hmm. but if you read everybody's like um, uh, 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 what am I looking for when they left the country? Um, if you lead, the first line is always because of slavery, right? Like the first line of a, the, what's it called when you leave? Secede, 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 the secession, yeah. yeah. So they're in every one of the secession letters, you know, the first line is about slavery, and then, you know, somewhere down in there, it was about state rights mm -hmm. in there. And he goes, well, you know, the right. evidence doesn't back that. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, I you took a quote that. from the bottom of the page, not, not right. from the top. Exactly. The, it, wasn't the bold, it wasn't the bold stuff that you took out of there. It was, it was, the, it was the fine, like, the and fine print. Uh, the et set. Yeah, right. <laughs> the thing that they say really fast in the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> what you took. that's what yeah. you took from it, yeah. Exactly. But it's a fascinating book, and he just kind of walks walks through the, the whole uh, slave trade. Yeah, I'm going to have to it's, read it's that. A, it's amazing. You know? And again, it's not done with, it's not done with any prejudice, you mm -hmm. know, or, or prejudgment. I'd like, let's, let's yeah. slow the word down. It's not done with prejudgment. Mm -hmm. It's really, really cool. It's I a, like to recommend books. So when I teach, I go to salons, teach curly hair. I teach cutting, coloring. I've done like protective styling classes. And I love to have literature that also can expand just the experience and help bring that connection. So I'm really excited to read that because it's I a great audio that. book too. Okay. Yeah, it, it really is. Audio and Clint audio and Clint audiobook. reads it. So which is really nice because it starts off with his family and his, his experience. So, you know, just to have that connection, you yeah. know, his family connection. Yeah. And by the way, talking about like how long ago it was, he talks about his grandfather's grandfather. My oh, grandfather's wow. grandfather was enslaved. Yeah. Wow. Right. Like right. that's my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. And like, right. that's, that's like, we're not that far off. No. Not not at th all. That's not that's not mm -hmm. that's not, you know, uh, 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 prehistoric. Right. You know, well, and I was reading something recently that said that you store, I think it's like 14 generations of like trauma or DNA, whether it's good or bad. Wow. So if you think about that, like that wasn't even 14 generations ago. Right. So it's like your DNA can store like five. it. Five. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. amazing. That's Isn't that crazy? Yeah. By the so way, not to go do look 14 generations do back. And do yourself <laughs> a favor, though, yes. or don't do yourself a favor. Think about how many people are 14 generations back. Yeah. Right, because you have four. Yeah. Each one of your grandparents have four grandparents. Each one of them have four grandparents. Yeah. Do that 14 times, and it's probably going to be more people that, that lived on Earth. Yeah. Do it. Do the math. It's crazy. It if, is crazy. If, if you break it down like that, yeah. you're like, whoa. Right, you know, it's so, so many people, so many. So many. and that's yeah. why, and that's why, if you if you if you look at it at a, we gotta get out of this thing, but <laughs> if you look at it at a micro level, yeah, is that we are all related because right. it's impossible for us not to be all related right. if you do the math, right, right, right? by because someone somewhere, yeah, by, by someone somewhere because at some point, you know, now granted, you have a small country like you know certainly our ancestry is from England, mm -hmm. right, so like it's a small country, so you know you you go four generations back and you have a larger population than all of England. Yeah. So there's some way that our, our, our we're cousins in some, in some manner, yeah. you know, and then you expand that out and certainly. Some cuz. I, well, what's we up, are cuz? because yeah, a lot yeah. of my ancestry is from England actually. So England, Ireland, so what's, we're cousins. What's up sis? Yeah. Yep. Air five. Air fives. That's awesome. Yeah. Martina. Thank you. Amazing so conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving us your time. Thank you for, uh, for uh, changing the, uh, the, the industry. Yeah. I really you. believe that. Um, yeah. I love what you're doing. And, and just thanks for hanging out with us, man. Thank you so much. It has been yeah. such a pleasure. Big big heart. Oh, I can't ever do that. Hand heart hug. I know. I can't. What, what's that? What's the the new, they, there's one that could, it's new. It's different. I don't know what it is. It's like. This, you got it looks like a gang sign now. Right. Yeah. I don't know. what. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. Especially not in Chicago. Let's not do that. <laughs> right. Let's not do that here. You know what, you know what that stands for? <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. That's not the one. No, but you know the letters. Yeah. Um, BBQ. Barbecue. Oh, no, I'm, like, I can't, I'm like, I can't see the other one. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're the barbecue gang. I love that. It's a good gang, man. That, yeah. Right? Always got good Hold food. on the brisket. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mart Martina, thank you so much for thank joining you. us for your day off.
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.